I'm actually doing the theology talk today. Woo! Um, so if we can start with like a quick prayer, that'd be awesome. All right, um, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, and now and at the hour of our death, amen. Uh, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and it is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, um, I wanted to start by asking a question, um, and hopefully someone will want to share. Um, all right. So, what is the most uh, special or meaningful thing that someone's been willing to share with you? Um, without you having to ask for it. Um, yes. Food. Food, yes. <laughs> that is a very good one. <laughs> okay, so sharing a little bit of themselves. Um, so I, um, in eighth grade, I was a big One Direction fan. Like, really. Uh, <laughs> Who's your favorite? Uh, Niall. Um, so I really loved One Direction, and I had a friend who also loved them. And she uh, showed up one day with a, with a spare ticket to one of their concerts. Um, they were floor seats right next to the stage. Oh, um, and wow. that was <laughs> that's a really cool yeah. experience. Um, so obviously I didn't have to pay for that. Um, her mom drove us. Um, and that was uh, you know, just her wanting to share that moment with me and wanting to share uh, in something that we both really enjoy. Um, so with that in mind, um, it's always really, I think, special to the person on the receiving end when someone is willing to share something with us um, that we didn't ask for, um, but we end up really enjoying. So um, today I'm going to be talking about our apostolic mission and sharing our faith in a secular world. Um, <laughs> So we're going to break this down a little bit, um, just as in, in terms of um, definition. Um, so what does that even mean? <laughs> All right, so an apostle comes from the Greek word apostolos, uh, meaning one who is sent off. Um, so that's the literal uh, definition of the translation. And um, mission is an important assignment carried out for <laughs> political, religious, or commercial purposes, typically involving travel. So in a very literal sense, um, an apostolic mission is being sent off on an important assignment um, that is carried out for, in this case, it would be religious reasons, um, that often involves traveling. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I want to start with a Bible verse. Um, so I just want you to keep this in mind. We're not going to talk too much about it, but um, they do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, so that it may shine to all who are in the house. So then let your light shine in the sight of men, so that they may see your good works and may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Um, so that is going to be our starting point. Um, I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> okay, so it's easy to see how this mission applies to priests. Um, a priest fulfills that in his ministry. So by taking care of his, um, by taking care of his flock, by uh, doing masses, taking care of this, uh, performing uh, the sacraments to the people in his parish. Um, and in doing that, he fulfills the mission that he was sent out to do um, in providing and fulfilling his ministry. Um, a religious, uh, by submitting her, uh, herself or himself um, to the orders of their superior, um, fulfills that mission just by being obedient and doing what they're told. <laughs> We're left looking like the little, uh, little guy there, kind of wondering how that applies to us. Um, we don't have a very clear guide as laity of what that means. Um, to us. Uh, obviously, we don't perform sacraments. Um, we don't have someone who we have to uh, directly obey telling us, go here, do that, talk to this person, talk to that person. Um, so oftentimes, we're just kind of 
left wondering or not even considering how um, we are called to be apostles as well. Um, so, um, this is another Bible, uh, Bible verse that I really enjoy. Uh, Certainly the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Uh, therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. Uh, go forth, behold, I send you out like lambs among wolves. Um, so, in the way that the apostolic mission applies to us is precisely in um, going out to the harvest. A priest is tied to his parish, right? He has to stay there. He has uh, people who he has to um, be there for and be the spiritual father. He can't go out to every office space. He can't go out um, to every school. He can't be at every university. He can't be there because he, he's a priest and he has to be at the parish so that he can tend to the flock. Um, someone who's taken a religious uh, vow, who's in a convent, is under the direction of their superior. They don't get to choose where to go. Um, they follow the mission that they are given, and they go to the places where they, where they are sent. Um, and they don't have much control over that. However, we go to a lot of places where um, you don't see priests and you don't see nuns. Um, we're able to go into concerts, we go to coffee shops, we go to, um, sometimes you work in an office, sometimes you work in a school. Um, we go to school, sometimes uh, you go to a Catholic school, sometimes you go to a secular school. Um, if you're um, uh, coaching a team, you're gonna be working with kids. If you're volunteering somewhere, um, you know, uh, the Red Cross, CCAP. We go to a lot of different places. Um, we're able to do that. We have that freedom to go, especially right now at this point in our lives where we're not um, really tied down too much or anything. <laughs> um, we're able to move. We're able to go. We're able to do things. And um, that's kind of uh, this is going. Um, we have that freedom, and in having that freedom, we also have a, a less specific mission, but it's still something that we're supposed to be doing. Um, so every day, or not, well, right now, every day, um, during normal conditions, at least every Sunday, um, when we come to Mass, at the very end, um, the, the priest or the deacon um, always says, go forth, the Mass has ended. <laughs> and we say, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, that's not, hopefully, that's not just something that we're repeating. Hopefully, it's something that we're listening to um, and actually taking into account because what that means is you've received Jesus, you've come, you have him. Now, go forth and share him. Go forth and share the gift that you have. Um, it is, go forth, I send you like a lamb among wolves. Um, and it is often very much that. We are um, not always welcomed in every space uh, when you come bearing the message of Christ. Uh, especially now in our society, it's not the most popular thought or opinion. Um, so it often feels like lambs and wolves. Um, but we were kind of warned about that <laughs> way back when. Um, so anyway, um, let's go on back. Okay, so um, that mission still applies to us. Now, how do we actually go about doing that mission? Um, so we um, are going to look at three different things. So pray, study, and love which nicely abbreviates to PSL. Or as some, uh, you know, um, or as uh, some of you might associate uh, pumpkin spice latte. So that's kind of the idea. All right, so now every time you order a pumpkin spice latte, what you're gonna think about is pray, study, and love. All right, so in order to accomplish our apostolic mission, we have to pray. All right, everyone, all right, so we're gonna pray, we're gonna study, and we're going to love. Um, okay. <laughs> so pray. 
Um, so I think this one, um, Father Vicaro kind of came in and uh, saved me some work because he already explained uh, what prayer life is for. Um, so hopefully all of you remember that um, and we're here for that. But brief recap. Um, so prayer obviously builds our relationship with Christ. Um, we can't claim to have a relationship with someone we don't talk to. Um, and prayer is talking to God, um, communicating with him about how you're feeling, how it's going, just like, hey, I'm having a really bad day, or like, hey, this day has been great, thank you so much. Um, so it helps build our relationship with God. It helps us um, know him, it helps us understand him, it helps us know that he is listening, um, that he's there, we always have somewhere to turn. Um, it's also the foundation of any mission. <laughs> Anyone who starts doing something without praying about it first um, is going to struggle more than they have to. Um, prayer always has to be at the base of everything. It's the fuel that keeps you going. It helps you discern what to do. It, it's the time when God speaks to you. Um, and that's where everything has to start. It'll make you be more in tune to God's will. Um, if you feel like you're being called one way, but he's like, hey, wait a minute, I need you to go over here, um, that's the moment where he's going to do it in prayer. Because um, in the silence, he speaks. So prayer is where we always has to be the starting point of anything. Um, and this is not an exception. Like I was saying, you can't run on empty. Um, Every car needs fuel. Our fuel is prayer. Our fuel is God. It is his love. And in prayer is where he gives an outpouring of himself into you. That's where he wants to give you graces, where he wants to talk to you and comfort you and love you. Um, and all of that is going to happen through prayer. So we have to make the time in our day, even if it's five minutes in the morning or five minutes at night, um, you know, even if it's just starting small, it needs to be there. Um, we always need to be praying or we're gonna run on empty. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you've ever run out of gas, fortunately I haven't, um, but when you run out, it's harder to get to a gas station to get more gas. So we just prevent that from happening. Um, if we prevent from getting to the point where we're just completely out, can't take another step, um, it's gonna be a lot easier. So we have to keep refueling in prayer. Um, study. Uh, I'm sure most of us love to do that. Uh, okay. So, before they were called the 12 apostles, they were the 12 disciples. Um, so, you have to be a disciple before you can be an apostle. What that means is sitting down and listening. It's admitting that you don't know everything and you need to keep learning. It's having that humility to um, go seek answers. Go find people who know more than you do and listen to what they have to say and learn from them. Um, you have to learn to follow Christ before he can actually send you out uh, where he needs you to go. Um, you also can't love something you don't know. Um, and by that I mean you can't love, um, I mean, you, can, certainly, but it's harder to love something that you don't know. So it's, it's hard to say, I love my faith when I don't know my faith. Then what exactly are you claiming to love? Um, we need to know and be aware of what the church is actually teaching, of what we're following, of um, why we follow what we follow and believe what we believe. Um, it's important to understand something. Because if you don't understand it, you're not going to be able to explain it. So you have to first understand it yourself. Um, I already went through that. <laughs> and I already also have a couple <laughs> Okay, so last one is love. And coffee is love, so I chose coffee for that one. Um, okay, so love. Um, what does that mean? Okay, so if you're praying, you're in tune with God's will, um, you're listening to him, you have a relationship with him, um, you're studying, so you're understanding why you follow Christ, 
why you do what you do, why you don't do what you, or why you stop yourself from doing um, things that go against uh, church teaching. Um, so the most important part before you can even start to love other people is learning to love yourself and knowing that God loves you exactly as you are right now in your life. No matter um, what you're struggling with, how broken you are, how many bruises you've got on you, exactly as you are, or as you were, or as you will be, God is going to love you exactly the same amount. And he loves every single person perfectly, regardless of whether or not that person loves him back. So that is number one before loving someone. We have to know that. Um, so going from that, um, loving other people, how do we do that? It's hard to approach someone that disagrees with you. It's hard, it's even harder to um, love that person uh, when they visibly are doing something that um, you know to be wrong. Sometimes it's a lot easier to look at someone who's living um, in, a, in a way that you know is not good for them, and the tendency is to judge them instead of trying to love them. Um, so by that I obviously mean people who are pro-choice, people who are gay, people who are transgender, people who are atheist or Buddhist um, or, you know, uh, liberals <laughs> um, it's a lot easier to judge them and clump them all together instead of seeing seeing them as individuals um, who we are called to love and in having conversations with those people sometimes we go into those conversations with certain ideas already in our head and we go and, we, and when we go in to talk to that person we're not trying to understand them, we just want to respond. We want to go in there and win the argument. We want to convince them with our words um, that they are wrong. And that is the wrong way to approach someone. You have to sit down with that person and listen and try to understand where they're coming from to meet them where they are. If you go in just trying to respond, you might win that argument, but you're certainly not going to win that person. Um, and it has to be about the whole person. And that kind of ties into, um, oh, I am missing one right there. Um, that's supposed to say don't approach people like their problems. Um, it has to be about the whole person. It can't be about um, just going to that person and trying to fix them, because as soon as you approach someone like they're a problem to be fixed, you've already lost them. Um, it has to be about wanting to save their soul. It has to come from love. It has to be about loving them and wanting them to know that they are also loved by your creator. Because if you know yourself to be loved by God and you've experienced that love and you know how that feels, you want other people to also know that love. Or you should want other people to also uh, know that love. So it has to be about the whole person. You can't just go in um, and tell them that um, you know uh, abortion is wrong. You should fix that. Um, it has to start with like, "Hi, what's your favorite color? What do you like to do for fun? Um, what's your favorite book? What TV shows do you like?" There has to be uh, a relationship. They have to first let you in before you can actually even start to help. And in order to do that, you have to approach them as a person, as an individual, as a, as a uh, son and daughter of God, who just needs a friend. Um, which kind of ties into, uh, we have to love them where they are. You can't, um, I mean you can't, you shouldn't. Uh, way to love a person until they're perfect because that's never going to happen. 
I don't think anyone in this room can claim perfection um, unless there's been an, uh, plus Mary, I mean Mary is here, but um, <laughs> uh, we have to love people where they are. We do that constantly in our lives with our friend group. Um, none of my friends are perfect. I'm not perfect, they, my friends know that. Um, but we love them where they are. And it shouldn't be any different with someone who disagrees in a more important aspect. Um, we can't expect people to change overnight or be different or wait until they are to love them. Someone, they, they need someone to love them in that moment because they don't feel loved. Um, so we need to, oh, there it is. <laughs> so we always hear this term, right? Love the sinner, hate the sin. Um, and it's kind of become uh, an overplayed cliche, so we kind of just dismiss it offhand. But um, we shouldn't, because that's very true. We, we should love the sinner not and, and hate the sin, because we are all sinners. <laughs> Hopefully you love yourself. Um, and if you do love yourself, you don't also love your sin. Loving someone doesn't immediately um, imply that you are in accord with everything they're doing in their life. Loving someone doesn't mean you're applauding every single mistake they make. It means that you're loving them and trying to lovingly correct them if they are doing something wrong. You are loving them and trying to guide them to where they need to go if you feel like they're steering off the right path. Um, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to love people. We're all sinners. So we're called to love people. It doesn't mean loving everything they do. Um, because there are certain things that we can't approve of because we know it ends up hurting that person. But it always has to come from that place of love and understanding and wanting the other person to avoid harm. Um, so love your neighbor as yourself. Kind of the same idea. Um, but that also implies that you love yourself and that you know yourself to be loved by God. Um, because if you know that in all your brokenness and even with all your mistakes and all your flaws and your imperfections, God still loves you, it makes it a lot easier to love other people in their brokenness, in their imperfections, in their mistakes. It's also really important to celebrate the steps that someone's taking to move closer to Christ. Because if we don't celebrate those little steps, as insignificant as they may be, maybe it's just accompanying you and saying grace. Maybe it's just asking a question about a Bible verse. Maybe it's coming to Mass on Sunday with you. It doesn't matter how insignificant it seems, that might be a really big step for that person. And, it's, and instead of encouraging them and inviting them and just reaching out, we diminish that um, step, it could just discourage them altogether. So it's really important to acknowledge the things that people are doing correctly while also trying to correct the things that they might not be doing right. Um, but even those tiny steps, you know, every journey starts with one step. Um, so, um, sorry, one second. Okay, so, um, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because it's, uh, near and dear to my heart. I, um, some of you already know this because I gave a different talk last year, but, um, I'm actually a, I call it a revert. Um, <laughs> into the faith. I grew up with a Catholic family, kind of. Um, we were uh, Catholic by tradition. Um, so our whole family have been Catholic, so we also went to Mass on Sundays. But um, I didn't really understand the faith, so in that sense, I kind of consider it more of a convert. But in middle school, I uh, kind of walked away. I left the faith for about six, seven years. Um, so I was an atheist um, for that time. Uh, and I say that to say this, uh, 
the person you know now is pretty, uh, in some ways, drastically different from the person I was three years ago. Um, I was uh, pro pro choice, um, pro gay marriage, like pretty much an entire liberal or liberal agenda. Um, I had a nose piercing, and oh. I shaved like the sides of my head. My hair changed colors like every month, so I have pink, blue, purple, green, like yeah. the entire rainbow. I was blonde for a second, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I looked very differently, and I spoke very differently, and I carried myself very differently. I um, have changed a lot, not through my own merit, but um, Three years ago, if you'd met me, it would have been a very different situation. And fortunately, at that time, there were people in my life who were willing to love me in that mess of a state <laughs> without asking me to change anything. Um, mainly that being my mother, but also the people around her who I, at that time, I found very annoying um, because they were way too nice to me and every chance I got, I was just trying to tear apart their faith um, because I disagreed with it. And I had a very deeply embedded hatred for the Catholic Church and I knew that they were Catholic and that annoyed me because they were happy and they were loving and they were kind and I couldn't wrap my head around why. Um, because I clearly was not a fan. Like, they could probably see it in my demeanor. Um, you can tell when someone doesn't really, like, want anything to do with you. So I was doing, like, putting everything forth to tell them, like, hey, I hate you, please stay away. And every time I come into the room, it's just like, oh, Carlo, how's it going? Just, like, come up and give me a hug. And it's like, please get away from me, I really hate you. Um, <laughs> but they kept doing it. And they kept coming back, and they kept embracing me, and they kept loving me. So eventually, back in 2019, when my entire like world fell apart, um, and I didn't feel welcomed in the environment that I did have before, um, I knew that I was welcomed somewhere. That place ended up being the last place I wanted to be welcomed, but um, I knew that I was welcomed there, in my broken state with all my mistakes, with all my scars, with all my bruises, I knew that I was welcome there. Um, so I turned to it and I decided to give it a chance and um, by God's grace, I am a very different person now. Um, and I say that to say this, you, don't, you have no idea who the, that person that you are judging can become. Um, and if you just write them off, instead of giving them a hand, you are denying them something that you've been freely given. Um, and I think in those moments when they are feeling really alone, when their entire world fell apart, when they just really need that friend. Um, if you choose to love them in that moment, you might not see the results, but you have no idea what God can do with that. Um, so it's really important to not shy away from those, over, from those opportunities. Do not close yourself off to people who look very different from you, who um, think very differently from you, who believe very differently from you, because most of the time, they just don't know a different way. They have no idea that um, our faith is what it is. They never had that encounter with God or someone um, to show them who God is. Most of the time, they don't have those people in their lives. Um, you don't choose the family 
you get. And sometimes not everyone gets lucky. And if we're not willing to share that message with them, they may never hear it. Um, I think it's Father Lumberg who sometimes says um, in his homily, the only homily someone will receive today is you. Um, because they're not coming to church. <laughs> they're not uh, reaching out to the priest to talk to him. They're not uh, seeking out uh, uh, retreats. They're not reading books uh, by saints. They're not looking for him, but they might encounter you. Um, and if you're able to give them that, if you're able to just love them and welcome them and accept them where they're at, um, that might be the difference between them accepting God and them not accepting and um, I also love the idea that the only hands, the only mouth, the only voice God has is yours. Because he did come as a man, um, but right now he passed that mission on to everyone else who's still here and following him. Um, so... Um, in his own words, I give you a new commandment, love one another just as I have loved you, so also must you, so as, sorry, just as I have loved you, so also must you love one another. By this, all shall recognize that you are my disciples, if you will have love for one another. Um, I don't know about you, but the way he loves me is, um, with my mistakes and with my sin and with my imperfections and with all the things that I still do wrong and I need to fix. Um, he never asked me to change anything, to love me. Um, and that's the way we're supposed to also love other people. Um, sometimes you don't, uh, especially if you're not in public and secular places, you don't encounter a lot of people, but even within our families, um, we can encounter people that don't agree with us. It, um, you know, it, it just because they're Catholic now, or because they believe what they do now, doesn't mean they're always going to, because even the best fall sometimes. <laughs> um, and maybe a family member will at some point um, leave the faith, and hopefully you wouldn't just shut the door to them. Um, so whether it's a family member or a friend, um, or maybe you do encounter someone who um, is outside of the church, um, and you become friends with them, we're just called to love them and walk with them. And when they ask our opinion, that's when we can express our true opinion in a loving way. Um, but we can't just approach them and say, um, hey, the way you're living is really wrong and you're going to go to hell. That is the wrong approach. Um, but um, at least in my family, we have a um, family member who's actually my uncle. And um, when he was younger, he came out as gay. And now he's married, um, simply, uh, in by civil union, to his partner. Um, he knows our opinion. Uh, he knows that we don't agree with that. We were not at the, uh, at the wedding. But we've never shut our door to either one of them. Um, they know that they are loved and they are welcomed. And that's part of loving the sinner while hating the sin. It's loving that person um, where they're at and hoping and praying um, that they will see there is a better way and change their ways and walk with God. But if we had instead 
shut that door, um, it would have given a very different message. It would have given the message that um, you're welcomed here so long as you don't make mistakes and so long as you agree with me and um, we will love you once you change. Um, and at least when that happened to me, um, I know that that didn't really make me want to follow that person. Because if that's what your religion is teaching, it's not really what I want to be doing. Um, so if we are called to love, it's loving from that place of brokenness and from that um, place of sin. Um, because, like I said earlier, we're all sinners. Just some of them are more scandalous than others. Um, but they're not necessarily worse sins. They are more visible. They do cause more um, disruptance. But it doesn't make them worse people. It just means they need extra love. Um, I love Fulton G. Just throwing that out there, he's awesome. Uh, the danger today is in believing there are no sick people. There is only a sick society. First of all, thinking and like trying to heal an entire society is just entirely overwhelming. Um, but if we look at it not as a sick society, but as a lot of people who need healing and need love, and we just think about one person, then that's not so bad one person. Um, we don't have to try to help everyone, but if you just help that one person, it might be the world to that person. Um, and we have to start seeing people as individuals who are struggling and need help and need that uh, helping hand. Not as a problem um, by boxing them into um, liberals by boxing them into um, the uh, you know pro-choice and pro-life by boxing them into um, LGBT and then the rest of us because when we start doing that it's very easy to just uh, to just shut people out to just forget that they are there and judge them but if we start seeing them as individual people it becomes a lot easier to love them because you start seeing them as actual people. Um, so I wanted to end with this. Um, it is from the Lorax, Dr. Seuss. Unless someone like you cares a whole, a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. Um, so I mean, that ends it's a very cute movie, very cute movie definitely watch it um, but unless someone cares enough to reach out unless someone cares enough to love them unless someone cares enough to want to help nothing's gonna change and it's not going to be because of them it's gonna be because of us so that's my talk continued being friends with me after my conversion um, is a friend that I've had for five years and he's gay. So I think it's very important to um, not push your beliefs. Obviously like don't compromise if they're inviting you to do something that would directly go against like going to a pride parade. Um, that would be compromising your beliefs. Um, if they're inviting you to go to a drag show, like that would be compromising your beliefs. So interacting with them in a setting that doesn't do that, so like going to get coffee, playing soccer, watching a movie, um, if it's 
not like a her heretical movie. Um, like sharing in those activities, that's a good place to start. Um, as far as like conversation, don't um, bring up a topic that you're not going to be comfortable talking about in a charitable manner. So um, if you're not comfortable talking about abortion, um, I would suggest not bringing it up unless they do. Um, if you're not comfortable talking about uh, same-sex marriage, um, again, like, don't bring it up unless you're ready to talk about that in a charitable way. Um, and waiting for them to ask your opinion, I think that's also really important. So not directly going and saying like, hey, I think your opinion on this is wrong. But if it comes up in conversation um, in just a very level-headed, calm manner without um, making it about them, uh, giving your opinion and your reasoning for that opinion in that moment, um, I think that's when you can uh, expose that to them. So as long as they understand where your beliefs lie um, and not accepting invitations to things that would directly compromise, um, I think that's usually like where you want to be. Does that make sense? Um, How would you necessarily explain the Catholic faith to someone who has no clue? Starting small. Um, so in the apologetics video that we were watching with uh, Father Mike Schmidt, who was talking about like um, theism, so belief in God, uh, Christianity, and Catholicism. So if it's someone who like absolutely does not believe in God, uh, don't start explaining like very Catholic teaching. Like just start by asking, um, what do you believe in? Like why don't you believe in God? Um, is there anything that would make you believe in God? Um, asking them and trying to understand where they're coming from and why they don't believe is a good place to start. Um, so I would suggest like starting with those conversations, very broad topics, um, not trying to get super theological right away because they're not going to understand that. Like if someone doesn't believe in God, they're not going to understand the mass doesn't matter how you explain it to them, like they're not gonna get it. So just starting from that very basic point of like, um, then what do you think about creation? Like what do you think about, um, uh, I don't know. Um, so just starting from like the very basic, like meeting them at their level and then growing from there. So once they start to understand God, then you can start explaining Christianity. Um, and just being very patient and walking very slowly. Um, yeah. It's kind of keep in mind when you're talking about celebrating even small steps towards God. Um, and, but it also kind of tags off Gabe's question because I'm thinking of someone, if, like if you have someone who is in a really, really problematic lifestyle right. and they just start making small progress, they're like even, you know, they might make progress but they're still in a state of sin. So if that, like, if, Maybe an example would make it clear where you know they're sleeping around a lot and then they have a girlfriend, but they're still having sex with her. It's like, how do you celebrate a step that is still a step into sin? It's just less grievous sin, or okay. it's still a step in the right direction. So when I say celebrate, um, I'm mostly talking about steps towards, like directly towards God. So like prayer, um, coming to mass, um, reading the Bible. Um, reading a book, like a theology book. So I mean more along the lines of direct, like concrete steps towards coming to the faith. Um, and as far as, um, I mean, yeah, you still couldn't celebrate that because it's still not a different, it, it's no different. You're just doing it exclusively with one person now. Um, so that's not um, what I meant mean so that's actually a good opportunity to clarify that um, I, I didn't mean to like celebrate small steps away from like grave sin but in celebrating like actual uh, concrete approaches towards God yes I think there is something to be said though for incremental progress that may not objectively be good but is subjectively better yeah so especially when it comes to replacing habits usually you can't go from one extreme to the other extreme. Right. It has to be 
kind of a slow burn thing. So you're taking a, an incredibly destructive behavior like, I don't know, hardcore pornography and replacing that with, I don't know, drinking heavily and then moving on from that. So it's like, it's an incremental, yes. like, slowly getting to the point where something is actually tolerable. Yeah. And then, but it's... So you can encourage that. You can, like, encourage them to continue, in, like, in increasingly moving towards virtue. What I mean is you can't celebrate them replacing an addiction to pornography with alcoholism. Does that make sense? Not really, no. Okay. Like, I get, I understand what you're saying, but I think, in principle, like, you know, sin is still sin. Right. But a less grievous sin is obviously preferable to a more grievous sin. Right. So, just as far as making a value judgment goes, like, Right. I, I understand what you're saying, but and I, I'm not saying like I guess okay. I'm not saying ends justify the means. I guess you could say if, I am glad you're no longer partaking in that. But like, yeah, especially if if the goal is to eventually get them in a better position. Right. Like, I don't know, relationships wise or something like you yeah. have to repair relationships with their family or friends or whatever, like. Even if what they're doing isn't good in the moment, if the objective is good, I think it's still. Yeah, I it's think been like encouragement is. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I think, like, yeah, I, in that sense, I guess you could say, like I was saying, like I'm glad you're no longer partaking in that behavior. That's great. I'm glad you're making strides. Um, without saying, um, you know, without attaching onto that, I'm glad you're no longer doing this and out drinking. I'm glad you're an alcoholic. <laughs> right, exactly. So I think you can, um, you can applaud their, like, no longer doing a, a, a sinful behavior while not applauding what they've replaced it with. Is that better? 